Let's our eyes up. Let's close our eyes for prayer. I will come here before you. We thank you for this workers' retreat. Thank you for the messages you've given us. Thank you for the way you've searched us and for the ways you've made us to see very clearly what you are requiring from us. Father, we pray that as we have had all these messages, we we'll receive them with attitude of matured adult people in Jesus' name. That will not be people who are continually hearing, but not making any improvement in our lives. Father, we pray that you will lay your hand upon every one of us, so that what we ought to be, by your grace, will be in Jesus' name. As we come to the end of this workers' retreat, we pray that you speak more to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's be seated, please. This morning, before you go, we want to get you through the Bible and show you why leaders fail. It doesn't mean that everybody that listens to a message like this will succeed. Because it's what you do with what you hear that makes you succeed or makes you to fail. And you find that in the Lentness class again, some people still fail. Then you get to the higher class and eventually there are those who fail. Some fail in the weekly tests that are given out. But they don't stop there, they fail in the, at the end of the semester. You don't stop there, they fail at the end of the session. Eventually they get to the top class and they still fail at the top class. Or some who appear to have been passing their exams at the lower classes eventually fail at the higher class. Then they go for external exam and those who have been succeeding internally in the school eventually fail the external exam. But then you follow students up to a higher level and you find that at the HSC or teacher training college or university, they fail. Some successfully get through university, so to say, and then in reading for their postgraduate, again they fail. As you look at the trend of failure, you must then begin to ask yourself, does failure stop at school? The truth of the matter is, failure is much more outside school than at school. And as you have heard what I've said now about failure in various stages of education, levels of education, that is just an indication as well as a parable to see that this is what happens to men in general. At the lower levels, younger age, children fail. But failure does not stop with children. When they become teenagers, they fail. In their 30s and 40s, you find a good percentage of people failing. Those who might apparently have been, even been succeeding before, then they get into their 50s and they have settled down in life. And now they fail every, in every important subject of their lives. Their marriages fail. Their businesses fail. In their lives, they fail. And as I told you that even when you think about postgraduate students, who you think now they've succeeded in every area of education, and now this is the last stage, in fact they have more time to themselves, they have to do some research and get some work done, eventually you find among these people those who fail. And there are those who have maybe graduated from the stage of young manhood, and now in the 60s perhaps, and people around them have thought that now these have succeeded in life just at the latter end of their lives before they leave this world they fail just as that postgraduate student before he leaves education uh, studying researching that he still fails a failure is like that and failure has not been actually well monitored and measured among human beings and because of that, the failure has been pronounced more and more in the lives of people. We have to be asking ourselves, why do people fail? Teachers have a lot to say as to why these uh, students fail. 
but they do not have a lot to say as to why they themselves fail. Now come to the professions that we have. You know that as we consider the professions that people have in the world, professional in the general sense, we teach, some of us uh, mechanics, some of us uh, engineers, some of us um, are managers and directors, some of us are involved in the work of God. But then as you consider the new form of work that people do, they, they too fail. Mechanics, tailors, you know, these, uh, the people that do some little, little works, they fail. Farmers fail. But it's unfortunate that preachers also, having the highest um, kind of work to do on the face of the earth, they fail. And the uh, percentage of failure among the preachers is very, very high. Higher than among the tailors, among the farmers, among the mechanics, among the engineers. That makes it very, very serious. So the question is, why do people fail in life? It's uh, almost a general thing. And, you know, when I was at school, I discovered that generally those students that are bad, they are bad all around. And sometimes you'll find a student that will say, well, in any case, uh, it doesn't actually matter. It's only arithmetic that I failed. You know that child uh, in primary school that says, it doesn't matter only arithmetic that I failed. You're watching when he gets to secondary school. He's going to fail algebra. He's going to fail geometry. He's going to fail trigonometry. He's going to fail everything related to mathematics. And uh, he's going to fail physics. He's going to fail chemistry. He's going to fail science subjects. Now, eventually, he's going to fail geography. Eventually, it's going to be a failure and a dropout. And you know, people that are saying, well, actually, you know, it doesn't matter after all. It's only my marriage that is failing. But all the other things are succeeding. You watch him. It's going to fail in every area of life eventually. And uh, you've uh, found students uh, that will say, well, you know, it's only English that uh, I fail. I'm very, very good in all the other subjects. Watch him. He's not going to get any certificate out of life. Not only out of school, out of life. It's not going to get anything. So there are times that uh, you look at Christian workers and they will say, well, actually, I'm good at this, I'm good at this, I'm good at that. It's only in this area that I fail. But watch him. It's likely eventually to be a failure all through. And you want to find out why do these people fail in life? Well, the same reasons we failed at school. If you've done a real study on Christian workers, you read biographies. You might discover that what made a person fail when he was an unbeliever. It's unfortunate, but it's true. It's what is making the man fail now as a Christian. Saved, new creature. Now in what he has put his hand upon now, it's not succeeding. Check up his life. What made him fail in the primary school, secondary school? What made him fail in life before he became a Christian? And before he became a Christian worker, he might find that's what made him fail, making him fail in the Christian work. You know, take this little example. A woman has uh, married before he be she became a Christian. The marriage failed because of her tongue. You know, living in that home, talking with the husband, sharp, terrible, the way she talks, that's exactly why the marriage is failing. Don't stay there. Come back. Follow her back to the secondary school. She was dismissed from school in class 3. Why? Her tongue got her into problem and she openly abused the uh, history teacher. Don't stop there. Go back to primary school. You remember the headmaster wrote a note and said, I want to see the parents of uh, this child. Why? She was so shockingly rude, even to the headmaster primary school. Go still far back, when she was very, very young. And uh, you know this child, when she was very, very young, she didn't have uh, any permanent friend. She was always losing all the friends. Why? Her tongue caused her into a problem. Now come back from there, come back to Christianity. Now she's a Christian. Wonderful Christian. She's born again, she's saved, she's sanctified, and she's telling us she's baptized in the Holy Ghost. And listen to her when she prays, she speaks in tongues. But then the state leader is saying, I'm sorry, I cannot lay hand on this, this, and this that this person has done. But it's difficult to keep this person as a worker. What's the problem? Steal her tongue. And if she would 
sit down and think very, very well. This thing that is causing failure now in the Christian work is what has caused failure in her marriage. Perhaps her marriage has packed up. It's what caused failure in a, in a school. It's what caused failure in childhood. And uh, a person might find, for example, that when he was at school, very sharp, and every time the, what the teachers will write in the remarks or report will say, this person has the brain. If he can work hard, he will be a good student. The teacher is saying the problem is laziness. Then he gets to secondary school. And again, the teachers are going to comment and they would say, well, if the parents will tell this child to work more than play, he can be fantastic. He gets into uh, the universities and um, at the university, going for tutorial, one of the lecturers will call this person to the office and say, look, uh, looking at you, whenever you really pay attention in class and whenever you really seriously want to do something, you are marvelous. You can do something. But you know, uh, you need to, how do you spend your time? Because uh, at the university, you cannot beat them. You cannot, uh, you know what they are doing now. But if you beat them, there is trouble. Uh, so you cannot beat them. All you can do is to call them and say, how do you spend your time? Well, you are sharp. But uh, do you get to the library at all? Do you do this at all? That lecturer is saying, and haven't you discovered this laziness in your life? Eventually, he manages and he passes through. And he's now out of university. And he's got a job to do. And he has prospects for promotion, for success in life. And again, uh, the managers and the directors are writing in his file. They are saying, well, he's educated and he, ha he seems to have a good brain. It's only that uh, he'll give excuse whenever there is hard work to do. He's lazy. Think about this boy. Now he's a man. What is causing failure in his life? The same thing that caused the failure of primary school, secondary school, university, even though he tried to manage through, is what is causing fa failure in his uh, life now. And then is a married man now. But anything is to do in the family, he's always saying, can't we do that tomorrow? And if the wife is saying, uh, look, these children, they need this now, they need this now, he'll say, I know they're important, I know we'll do them, we'll do them, uh, at least. If we don't do that thing today, it doesn't mean that uh, the children uh, will go naked or something, we'll find time to do that, we'll do that. What's called, so they, fail, they marry to fail again, the thing that caused him from primary school, although he's not a Christian, Although he's now born again, and thank God he's born again, he's going to heaven, but he will not enjoy Christ or enjoy the Christian life down here. He will not enjoy success, he will not enjoy Christian work, he will not enjoy anything. He might get to heaven just like he got to university. Almost missing the chance, they kept him on the waiting list. But eventually, thank God, he got to university. And you know, there are people that get to heaven like that, on the waiting list, but eventually, thank God, when the door was about to close, they okay, you come in. Failure. All through people's lives. You see, that's why we should be very, very careful. And a message like this that I want to give you this morning, why leaders fail, it's not a message you uh, throw over from your shoulders and throw to another person. You want to find out. Sit down. Check your life from the primary school, from when you were young, from before you were converted, what is it that has been causing this failure? Dissatisfaction in life. You've not been able to do what you wanted to do, what you could have done, but the failure has been following just this area, or this area, or this area. So all that we say now can be applied to almost anybody, but it's only that we're concentrating on Christian workers. And if there is any failure, perhaps in your marriage, you can think about all these things that I'm going to give you this morning. Very brief, but yet telling you this is why people fail in their lives. And I believe that if you really meditate on what you are going to hear, and you get to the Lord on your knees and say, Lord, I have a single life to live. This single life, I will succeed. And I have found people who have failed up to maybe secondary school, secondary three or secondary four. And uh, maybe one of the teachers called them and he sat them down and he said, look, you are not good for anything. And they talked to them very straight. And after talking to them like that, they cried. But then they went to the hostel, to the dormitory, and they meditated and said, why am I crying? 
what this teacher is saying is true. But why is it true? I know the reason it is true is because of this, this, and this. I am going to change. All the things that this teacher said, that I will never make it, I will never do this, I am going to prove it wrong. All of a sudden, this student were cut off, going to the field for football, wasting time, doing this, doing that, and just comes around, and he, be he becomes very serious. Within three months, there is a change. Within six months, there is a change. I know it because it happened to me. When I was in the primary school, I started since 1948. I've been in school. I didn't get to, you know, they said, uh, you'll be in class one, go to class two. When I finish class one, they put me in class one A. <laughs> I think I, I started 47. And that time your hands have to reach your ear like this. Then they eventually pushed me to class two. And my father will beat me at home for, uh, just to study. The teacher will beat me at school to study. But it wasn't, uh, I was wondering why, why all this trouble? Why are, they, why are they tormenting me like this, harassing my life? <laughs> they put me in class 2, uh, 1949. That's, you, that time, they, were, they have not allowed me to go to standard 1, but just to be doing preliminary for primary. So eventually they put me in class 2. Then again, when the others went on, I went to class 2B. <laughs> and then I got to standard 1. Then standard 2. And if, even when we were taking, because those days we had to take exam in standard two to go to standard three in another, in another village. But even near the exam like this, what was I doing? I was playing and sleeping because we went, for, we went in another place to go and have that examination. And eventually, uh, when we took uh, the exam, I think 52, I said, will I pass? Because, you know, I wasn't very sure. And I remember what they asked uh, those days, 1952. They put charge singular. Then they put plural here and put dash. They want you to put children. And I'll be wondering what is uh, what are we to put here? Is it child or child? <laughs> no, I wouldn't know. Eventually, they said, okay, go to standard three. Standard four. The teacher was so, was so furious with me. And he saw me playing somewhere and laughing. He called me and said, why are you laughing? Of all people. You don't know any arithmetic, you don't know. English, you don't know. Geography, you don't know. Physics, you don't know. Nothing that you know. And you have time to laugh in your, in your life. And he abused me and said dirty, dirty things, more dirty things. I still remember what I don't want to tell you. <laughs> Eventually, I got to uh, five. That time, uh, 35, they, they, they said now, uh, standard five. I, they called them primary six now, and they pushed us out of uh, school. They pushed us out. I didn't have secondary school to go. How could I have secondary school to go? I was lazy beyond description. To read was trouble. I, I knew how to play. How to read, I didn't know. Then eventually, uh, they sent me to modern school. And all, I could, all they did in the modern school, the only thing that interested me was the use of watercolor. Just painting. The arithmetic, the English, all the other things. I said, why are they, why are they troubling us with all these things? <laughs> but you know the watercolor and everything, I like that one. <laughs> Eventually my father said, ah, ah, my firstborn in a modern school, you should go to secondary school. Pulled me out of that place again and then put me in another place. Studying for uh, secondary school. I studied and studied and studied. At that time now, I went to a particular a school that was just uh, starting. Well, you know, to get to King's College, in fact, I didn't even take the form. I knew that that would be, you would be wasting the money for the form. And to go to any of these other groups, but the one that just started the previous year, where the one students where that school is not popular, it's not known very much, but now, if you take exam there, when the other good uh, people, when they choose this, choose this, choose this, and then you will find a way, a place in this uh, new school. So I got to that new school eventually. Class 1, Class 2, Class 3, Class 4, just nothing. They were just pushing me on. You know, in a new school, they want to bring in new students and you know, push you forward. To, it's not government school. But they were all the time writing in the, in the report. If this uh, boy will read, maybe he can do well. Let him work harder. Uh, all those comments depicting laziness. I won't write my notes. 
all that time when they're teaching them biology or something, I'll be looking for a word. So when we come out, I'll be, I will play with uh, some of those words, uh, just play with my friends. But to write notes, I'll sit at the back of the class where the teacher will not say I'm not writing notes. I didn't understand life or education or anything. I mean, people are going to school. I was sent to school. I went to school, finished. But 1960, in class four, or on holidays, I waited behind. Then I sat down and said, look at my age now. And school start is coming next year. I'm not going to live my life like this. So I just changed. During that time, I took the notes of all the others in biology, in chemistry, in physics, and all the other notes they have been writing. I sat down, I wrote everything. I said, now I am going to make this thing. Even ordinary uh, geometry, till class 3, I was still getting 5% in geometry. And uh, algebra, I was uh, lucky, I was uh, getting on well. Cla class, another class, I got 24 in, in uh, geometry. Chemistry, almost nothing, sometimes. I, sometimes I get 0% in history, complete zero. Because for that one hour, I will look at the examination paper like this, I will not recognize anything in that question paper. Even till we were in class uh, 4, 1960, I remember the name of the teacher. Sometimes he will not even point at me to ask any question when he's asking questions from all the other people. It's because he knew that uh, it was a waste of his time. But that class 4, I sat down and said, this thing that is causing failure, I'm going to rectify it. Nobody talked to me. If I didn't know that I would ever make anything. I just decided, I didn't even know the reason. I did. It wasn't because, well, being the firstborn of my father, not, no, I didn't even think of that. Being a this or being, I didn't think, it's just that, ah, ah, since primary school. Why am I like this? And yet, if, you, if we are playing and you did anything, I can remember anything we did on the field, anything we did when we are running around. It's the geography I can't remember. And it's the same brain that remembers all these other things that is not remembering this, no, I will change. And that year, 1960, getting to class five, I passed. Not that like they were pushing me forward before. Class 5. When, from the first uh, day we opened like this, I wrote all my subjects now. I wrote A1 in front of them. And I put it every time I'm going to study, I put it down there. And I would get to the class. I would study. I would ask questions from the teachers. I would do everything I ought to do. All the other students would say, ah, come with Well, which one is this? Before. I will run out of the school and go to children and self in church, one white garment in town. I will leave all the other students and, be, and go to be dancing, dr beating drum uh, in the children and self in church in town. But that 1961, uh, I cut off all the things and I said, this year, school start is coming, I'm going to do something. All the other students will say, ah, and say, come A1, A1, A1. Because I wrote, everybody can say, I just wrote everything down there. And I studied. And you know, I had one of the best results in our class, in school search. And when my father said, please, I don't have money to send you to HSC, I, do, I said, don't worry. I picked up at the um, uh, advanced level on my own, and I began to study. And my pure maths, I had A1. Applied maths, I had A3. I went to University of Ibadan. From the University of Ibadan, all through like that, by the time I would come out, I had the best results in the whole university. But that's because 1960, I sat down, I said, this failure that had been following me from primary school up to this point, I'm breaking it. I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't born again. I just said, this one, it will not continue. I'm breaking this one. You should break failure in your life. Amen. And sit down and think. And don't you, this is not a pretense. No teacher, if all the teachers, if I stay with what the teacher said, I will never have made anything. They abused me. They cursed me. They did everything. They discouraged me. Well, I just decided on my own that I'm going to change. And I've discovered that when I was at school, all those times I was failing, the major thing in my life was laziness. That time. The brain was there. The understanding was there. No motivation because a lazy man doesn't have motivation for anything. No forward looking. A lazy man doesn't look forward. A lazy man is just saying, well, uh, he might wish, he might desire, but no strong drive to actually get anything done. It's too lazy to plan his life. And since I knew that was the basic thing, the major thing in my life, when I became a Christian, I distinguished myself. And when I became a Christian worker, I had known that 
if I will just be up at it, walking my fingers to the bone. And anything I want to do in the Christian service, I know that if I will not allow this uh, laziness of that time to come back, I uh -huh, that I'll make it. You know, people wonder now, why, how can you preach uh, two times on Monday, three times on Thursday, and uh, four times on Sunday almost every time? <laughs> well, if I was like I was before, to even preach once is trouble. But now, preaching four services, because I'd broken that thing in my life since 1960, before I was even converted. And I've discovered that if I don't uh, keep at this thing and be deliberately hardworking on whatever I do, that success will never come. Now, prayer life, you know, laziness alone can spoil the prayer life. Quiet time. Laziness alone, I will do it later. I'll do it. can spoil quiet time. Even pray to know the will of God on this marriage, I will pray. Is it not a, a God is there? I am here. And God is a simple God. And once I ask him, God will answer. The laziness alone, pushing it forward, I will do it. It can spoil the whole of your life. But thank God, I broke that thing. And this morning, I'm calling on you to please understand that every one of us can succeed. But you must now check up your own life personally, personally. Not relating it with brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, on a personal basis. And say, if this thing has been causing my lack of success, not having what I dreamt to have, desired to have, what is it that is causing it? I'm going to remove it. And I believe it will be removed in your life. And uh, this message alone, you will say, well, I thank God. You know, in those days, my teachers didn't change. 1960. The same uh, man that was teaching the history, he was still the same man. The same man teaching the geography, teaching the mathematics. All of those people were the same. The classroom did not change. Our library books, uh, you know, the library was still the same. All the conditions were the same. I was the only person that changed. Because I changed. Even though conditions around me remained the same. Because I changed, everything in my life changed. Until today, that change is still following after me. Things around you may not change in life. Circumstances, environment, uh, your brain, everything will remain as they have been. But if you will have a change, success is in front of you. Now, why do leaders fail? Already I've told you some of these things and all these uh, illustrations I'm giving you. But then let's look at this one by one. I know we don't have enough time, but just briefly, let's look at these things one by one. Why leaders fail? Number one, unfaithfulness in the lives of people. Unfaithfulness in either adding to instruction or taking from instruction. This is what happened to Saul in the Old Testament, the first king in Israel. He failed because he was unfaithful. On your own, you can read later, 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Read the whole chapter. You perhaps know the story. He was sent out to go and destroy the Amalekites. If he had kept with that instruction, he would have succeeded. He had all the instruments, all the weapons of war. He had all the people, all the soldiers that would have helped him to get the victory. Everything he ought to have as a king at war against another uh, particular set of people to accomplish what the Lord sent him for through Samuel. He had everything, yet he failed just because he added to the instruction and took away from the instruction. I know many times we add everything it takes for success. The Bible, the doctrine, the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the call. Everything it takes for success we have. But unfaithfulness can cause failure. Adding to instruction. Here we are that in the church, the leadership in the church either from the general superintendent or the state representative or the pastor of the local government area, whoever you are directly responsible to in the work of the Lord. 
instruction has been given. And you have all the instruments, and you have all the weapons, everything to make success. You have everything but unfaithfulness and either taking away from the instruction or adding to the instruction. What happened uh, at the time he was to have waited for Samuel for seven days? In 1 Samuel chapter 13, again, he wasn't able to carry through the instruction. And God said, that man is a failure. I rejected him as king. I found another man for myself. And yet, he had everything that could cause success. Number two, carelessness in morals. Carelessness in morals. Already, uh, a brother who gave a message on marriage yesterday told us about something. In Judges chapter 14, just write this down. Judges chapter 14, verse 1. Then Judges chapter 16, verse 1. He's talking about something. He was careless in morals. He failed. Again, listen to me. He had all the power it took to be a victor, a conqueror, all the time over the Philistines. He had everything it took. The problem was not having the power or the instrument well, for something. If it was the jawbone of an ass, it was a good instrument. It was, if it was a lion that met him, it was a good thing because he tore the lion in pieces. And even when he did not have any instrument in his hand, he could carry the gates of a whole city, carry it away. He had all that he needed for success, but he was careless in morals. We found people that have everything. The equipment to preach, the doctrine, the Bible, the workers, the plan, the goals, a good ministry like this, a good church like this, giving instruction, uh, telling you go this direction, this direction, has everything to succeed. And the possibilities are great for him to succeed. And yet, because of carelessness in morals, he's not in control of his body. And any part of your body that is out of control will make you immoral. If you are not in control of any part of your body, not in control of your ears, what you hear, of your mouth, what you say, of your hands, of any part of your body at all, even your mind, if you are not in control of that mind, and the mind uh, without your permission can go astray and think on things that are forbidden. If you are not in control, it causes failure. And you know Solomon, very, very wise. But in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 26, even Solomon did outlandish women cause to sin. That man was a failure. And you know, the, gov the government of the kingdom broke when his son got there. Be control of your mouth. That means don't talk to your neighbor. Use your eyes when your ears missed what I said. Be in control. If you look straight at me using your eyes, generally a preacher will repeat that thing again, generally. Have you ever noticed that preachers, when they say, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 26, while he himself is opening, he says, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 26. Have you noticed them like that before? The preachers are there. Now, if you use your eyes, when your ears have missed what the preacher said, and you're looking at him, you will get it later. Be in control. That's what we're saying. If you are in control of different parts of your body, you will succeed. And I can't see, sincerely speaking, anybody here having a reason to fail. God is on your side. Christ is on the throne. The devil is permanently defeated. And the Bible, the weapon that defeated him, even before Jesus went to the cross, that whole Bible, not just New Testament alone, not just Old Testament alone, everything is in your hand. But, my brother, the Holy Ghost will not read it for you. You know, I discovered that the sickness I had when I was at school that did not allow me to read chemistry, when I became a Christian, it was the same sickness that wanted to hinder me from reading Bible, laziness. But because I had broken it, and that laziness was knocking at the door, uh, thinking, can I come in now? I said, where? 
nonsense. Now you are a Christian and everything is okay. Can I come in also? You sleep more and you do this more. I said, don't come in. I drove you away in 1960. And I'm still driving you away. I'm still going to read my Bible. And I don't know how you will be able to understand this. When I became a Christian and I drove away that laziness. I read my Bible the way I read chemistry, biology, physics, mathematics at the secondary school. Even till now, I have timetable. And I will make sure that this is done, this is done. Some of our state representatives, they know. Like even last night. Last night, at around, after 11, you know, some people were still coming, wanting to see me. Oh, I said, I'll miss my timetable. And I said, please, for today, no more. And I went in. Because if I keep on there, there like that, as a preacher, and I do not have any breathing space, any time at all, when I get in, when you have preached, you have counseled, you have done everything, the people are happy, I make the people happy, I make myself unhappy. And I will just sleep and not be able to read the Bible. Oh, no. Uh, how if I, when I was preparing for, uh, you know, school start or any of these exams, will I allow people to just keep me talking and keep me talking? Without reading my books? No, I will still keep the same thing till today. But you know, people who don't understand these things, this is why they fail. Simple, simple reasons why they fail. Now, I talked about carelessness in morals. Number three, in Second Chronicles, chapter 16, verses 7 to 10, if you read it later, oppression of workers under them. Oppression of workers under the leaders. Now you will find that when I was in school, I was never senior prefect. I couldn't have been. And I was never, uh, those days in the primary school, we call them monitor. I don't know why they call them monitor. But that's the name we call them at that time. Class monitor. Instead of a prefect. I mean some parts of a primary school. But you know, I was never a monitor or janitor or prefect or president or anything. I was just a student. But do you know that? Just thinking back, and I think back a lot. That's how I learn. I have to look at life, analyze life, and uh, bring everything back together again. You know, I remember the prefects and monitors in the primary school. I didn't see any of them succeeding. Yes, they were neat, and uh, whenever they come, whenever they came to, you know, the student assembly, and they stood before, they stood while the teachers were lining up, and they stood before them, uh, beside them, you will see that he, by the posture and appearance, is good. He, this is the monitor. And when he goes around the school compound, finds any of us in the lavatory, and will say, all of you there, come out. Or when they are the law in the, uh, in the primary school, never speak vernacular, always uh, speak English, a law I broke every day in the school. You know, when they put, when they have their paper in their hand, and they will say, I catch you again, William, you have spoken uh, vernacular. I will say, I didn't there. <laughs> you know. But you know, I watch all those prefects and monitors. They didn't pass their exams. I came to secondary school, and I found again that that senior prefect, my neat, tall, the, the personality was wonderful. You know, he didn't pass his exam. I came to university and I saw the president of the student union in our own time. And all those people, one by one, look at their lives. This is what I find in their lives. And now I'm no more a student. I'm now a preacher. But I see the people who are prefects among Christian workers. Great, great evangelists. Their personality, their posture, you can see, very, very fantastic. But you know they are not succeeding. They have crusades in the north, in the south, and everywhere. But look at their use of language. They don't understand how to use language. Communication, they don't understand. Interpersonal relationship, they don't understand. Even the preaching is only money they want to collect. And you see them all over life. Learn from life like I learn from life. I really sit down and I think. And I try to learn from life. And if you... If you are a Christian worker, 
and you say, Lord, all these things that have happened to other people, they fell by the side of the road. I don't want to fall like that. I want to succeed. But one of the things I found among those prefects is that they oppressed those younger people under them. And the leaders that oppress workers will not be considerate and see the needs of the people that are subordinate to them. You know, they will not eventually succeed. Well, that's what the Bible says. In number four now, uh, independence among workers. Now that independence uh, means a person that doesn't want to be under control of anybody. He wants to, you know, do his thing independently, in isolation. He wants his life to be secretive and personal to him. And he is not an open person that, you know, you can talk to on his marriage, on his family, on his children, on his life, on his spiritual life. He just likes to keep an independent attitude. He doesn't want to, you know, listen to a particular leader, doesn't want to, you know, listen to anybody at all, just live an independent, isolated life. And um, I found that people like that again, feeling, people used to, after I changed, you know, before 1960, I never asked any teacher any question. What's my concern with them? They were in their profession teaching so that we can pay school fees and give them money. And then I was just at school enjoying myself. And school days are, you know, just when you are young. And it's out of the school days I should get what I called the best, you know, play and uh, fight. Uh, you know, those days, you know, I was tiny. They called uh, some of us tiny thoughts at school. But if I didn't see a fight to attract attention to myself, I made one. Even when I knew that that man was, uh, I mean, what, uh, what was I going to use time for? I wasn't going to read in the library. I wasn't going to study mathematics. I wasn't going to study. And the time was there. And I've come from the uh, game, from the field. And, uh, you know, everybody is just quiet. And, you know, I didn't like uh, quietness those days. I mean, everybody, you know, studying and reading their books. And I came to this one and I said, uh, <laughs> you're, you're reading. You want, to, you want to finish everything in one day? Come up now. I say, Kumui, if you touch it, I'll say, I'll take that thing off. I just liked everybody to be happy and laugh, and then that man may strike me, and I drew him out, and I tell the whole class, now watch, we're going to make game for you. <laughs> but, and that man may flog me very, very well. But you know, I enjoyed it. <laughs> because nobody to advise me, no advisor, nobody at all. <laughs> you know? Yet. To understand that a person like that could change. That's why I have hope for you. I don't think you could have been as bad as I was. If I changed, you can change. Amen. And now you are responsible Christian men and Christian women. You are no more secondary school person, primary school person, who doesn't know what life is all about. You came from the north, coming to a workers retreat like this, long, long journey because you are looking for something in your Christian life, in your Christian race, you should get that thing you are looking for. Yeah. And so, independence, no advisor, no counselor, nobody to say, now why not put this one there? Why not remove this one from there? That was the type of life I loved. I never did any assignment for any teacher. They gave us the assignment, I said, that's good for you, I just put the thing there. I lived an independent life. And I find that what makes people to still fail today is that they won't do the assignment given out by the general superintendent. I mean, you know, they just put the assignment there. They will come for the next workers' retreat. But the one we did before, they are not going to obey. They are not going to carry out the assignment. They are not going to do anything at all. It's just like a life without control, a life without supervision, a life without, uh, you know, saying, put this one there, do this one. And you know, there are workers like that who will not take instruction from state representative. No, brother, in your location, get this, don't get this. No, no, they don't like assignments. They just like independent life. Live my life the way it looks best to me. Instruction from anybody, I'm sorry. But you know that is not good. But if we're going to succeed, you begin to think about your life. And you'll say, I know it's wonderful to be under submission. Think about Joshua. Listening to uh, Moses doing his assignments. Go and fight. Uh, you know those places, I'll be on top of the mount praying for you, and they went, and he carried out the assignment. Look at Joab, carrying out assignment from David, listening to instruction, not living independent life, and when they finish, what do I do next? 
Look at Daniel in Babylon. They have been trained and they carried out instructions. Look at Peter and James and John and the apostles asking for instruction. Look at Jesus Christ himself. I did nothing except what my father told me. Why don't you listen to instruction? That's the path to success. But you know, independence, saying I will do what I like anytime I like it, the way I like it, you know, that will not work. It makes a man to fail. So, independence causes failure. Then, lack of working with goals. Evaluation and taking inventory. Lack of working with goals. Working with goals. Evaluation and taking inventory. You can read later on your own. Luke chapter 14, verses 28 to 33. If, if a person does not have a goal, the ultimate thing he wants to achieve, the work of the Lord, he will not be able to have the success he ought to have. Then, self-confidence and prayerlessness it causes failure. You remember James chapter 4, verses 1 to 3? Ye have not because ye ask not. Number seven, pride. Taking credit for success and passing the blame for failure. Right now, I will explain to you later. Pride. Taking credit for success and passing blame for failure. You see, everything that is good, that is done, even done by all the other workers, this uh, leader or this Christian worker will take credit for it. And any failure that comes in the work, even the failure that is responsible for, he'll pass it to other people. Oh, it's so and so that made the failure to be like that. You remember Aaron? Aaron had made a calf. And the children of Israel, remember, use your eyes when you've missed it with your ears. Did you hear me? Don't use your mouth. Don't use your mouth. Now, brother, don't use your mouth. Use your eyes and look at me here and pay attention. Let's be under control. You know, I've told you, when we're under control, success is coming. Yeah. Or when the preacher is talking and the people are talking, you, I cannot hear what you are saying, you cannot hear what I'm saying. That's what we did at school. That's why we failed. And that's why we're here this morning. <laughs> to say, looking at our lives and repeating our history so that we will not fail. You understand? Uh-huh. You know, in the classroom where the teacher is teaching, don't use your mouth, I've told you, just use your eyes. Now, in the class, while the teacher is talking on principles of success, the man is still following his uh, practices of failure. So let's be careful. Now, I've told you that, you know, sometimes a, a, a teacher or a leader will do something, and there is failure. Instead of accepting the blame for the failure, he will not. He will pass it to other people. You know, if uh, sometimes you pass the reason for your failure, and how many people you find at school that will say, well, I should have been educated. Is that teacher that was not a good teacher? If the teacher was not a good teacher, how about the textbook, not a good book? How about the other students that were in the same class, taught by that same teacher who passed their exams? And you know there are people that give excuses like that. If their marriage is failing, it's my husband. There are wives that have husbands that are worse than your husbands and they are succeeding. And other people who are men, if uh, the marriage is failing, it's my wife. How about other men that have wives that are worse than your wife and they are succeeding? Passing the blame. It's so and so's fault. It's so and so that made me to fail. But when there is a good thing, they take the credit, they won't understand, oh, it's the credit belongs to all the other people. And it is pride that acts like that. Number eight, worldliness that causes failure. Worldliness, it causes failure. You can write down Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But you know, when we mention uh, worldliness, Oh, we say thank God. I mean, oh, there's no worldliness in deeper life. Because the moment uh, we, use, uh, we use the word worldliness, your 
permit me to say this? Will you permit me? Okay. Your ignorant mind, you permit me to say that? Uh-huh. Your ignorant mind will say, oh, we are not worldly. We are not using jewelry. We are not using this. We are not using that. And you know that man. He thinks about material things more than he thinks about spiritual things. That's worldliness. What will I eat? Where will I live? What clothes will I put on? How will my children be educated? How will this one befit me? How will this one happen? All, every time thinking about material things rather than spiritual things. That's what is called worldliness. Because your thoughts and your minds are all filled up with things that are material and worldly. And you think about, uh, have you seen the ladies that fail in their marriage? Even in, in church? And sorry to say, in our church? What's causing the failure? Worldliness. Because at the time they were going to get married, they got married on the basis of worldliness. They didn't use jewelry. In fact, this, uh, this was the sister that said, Ah, in my marriage, I will not use this, I will not use that. And that woman is worldly to the core. Because before deciding that marriage, instead of thinking on the spiritual thing, or be thinking, you see a graduate? You go and ask those who have married graduates, who didn't marry Christians, but graduates. They didn't marry the right person. When you marry somebody who is a graduate, if that person is a real child of God, the number one thing in his life is that number one is a child of God, two, he has a mind of Christ, three, his affections are set on things above, four, he still wants to love the Lord till he dies, five, in fact, the graduate thing you are talking about comes last in his life, if he's a real Christian. The people that are bringing their certificates for, to work as a treat to show everybody, Brother, did I meet you before? No, we have never met. Do you know me? No, I don't know you. I'm a graduate. <laughs> you don't believe? Come. Look at my certificate. I brought it to work as to show people like you will not believe. <laughs> you know, those are not Christians. What leaners? And there are ladies that they are in our church. And uh, the leader will call them. Have you been praying for this uh, marriage? Well, I've been praying. God didn't speak to me. He will never speak to you. Because, you know, that one came. Before you went to pray, you were going to indirectly ask, Okay, brother, you said God has convinced you. You are sure? And you can take care of a woman? Uh -uh. Since uh, I pray to know the will of God. Okay. Where are you working? Well, I'm working at uh, the merchant bank. As what? Anybody can work at Merchant Bank. <laughs> well, I am uh, in a clerk there. Okay. In your mind, you know, a graduate cannot be a clerk. You say, okay. Uh, you, have, you saw the state trip. You saw the pastor. Yes, I said, okay. Uh, go and see him again. I will tell you the answer. And then, uh, God, <clears throat> you know what I, the covenant I have with you, not these people. And if I don't find the right one in this uh, place, your children are everywhere. Your children are there. Who doesn't know that? They are everywhere. <laughs> are they not everywhere? Uh -huh. They are the university too. <laughs> you know? They are the bank. They are the director's desk. Those children, they are everywhere. And you know eventually. This person, when, uh, you know, this one has come, is a clerk, this one has come, what are you doing? I'm just a trader. And you travel about a lot? Yes. With aeroplane or with what? <laughs> well, I just travel with, uh, you know, there is uh, austerity now. I travel with the ordinary, ah, uh -huh, that's good for you. Uh, the, if this one were a graduate, you'll be traveling by, you'll be traveling by aeroplane. Go and see the state leader. I will tell, I will give the answer to the state leader, and then you can collect the answer from, <laughs> from him. Eventually, when the, the right uh, person comes, and then he says, Sister, how are you? And he's speaking good English. Ah, we'll say, ah, bro, where, which uh, university do you go now? I went to this other one. Uh, is that so? Okay, what have you come for? I just uh, prayed. I knew the will of God. I've been waiting for you. Uh, have you, you told the state leader? No, I didn't uh, tell him. Well, whether you tell him or you don't tell him, I'm for you. You are for me. And eventually they won't go their way through and they see the state leader and they have known the will of God. Worldliness.
They don't choose jewelry. These are the people that will tell their parents in our marriage we're not going to use alcohol. Whether you use alcohol or not, the one you have used, is it not more than alcohol? <laughs> in our marriage, you are not going to wear this one, we're not going to wear this one. You are wasting your time. Wasting your time. And those people, they come together. You go and find out those who marry all those who married all these graduates. They beat one another like anything. I was telling you like, that I fought when I was in school. I, they are fighting is more than my own. <laughs> they will fight. They will bring themselves to the state representatives. You know, my brother, my sister, our brothers and sisters who married and their husbands or wives, they are just, you know, truck pushers and they are farmers. We don't settle quarrel for them as much as we settle quarrel for graduates. These people that can talk English, the more English they talk, the more counseling they need. <laughs> you know. But if a person really wants to marry and he wants the will of God, not just saying hey, this is what I want, this is just the will of God, that will of God may be a graduate, but a converted graduate. He is subdued, he is submitted to the word of God. You know some people that are graduates. You never know that they are graduates. The best thing you know about them is that he is a child of God. It's later when you are, maybe you met him. Maybe you went to an office. And uh, this brother is working there. And then uh, you find him in that office. And you see him. Uh, they said they are, they are going to take you to uh, the director's. Uh, maybe you are looking for work. And you get to that place. And you see this brother. And uh, then he says, oh sister, how are you? Oh brother, are you very humble. That was ah, ah. so. These are deeper life people. Look at where this person and we are. When we see him at the, these are the people carrying benches from one location to the other. When we are going to have Bible study, so this one is a graduate. No, he's a Christian, and the graduate is subordinate. Amen. If you marry that one, you are not marrying just uh, the ordinary graduate. You know these uh, graduates that were you reading about in the papers now. Uh, these ones that can that can burn a human being. Born a, born a vehicle, born house. Huh. They can burn a wife. <laughs> they are not careful. Looking for graduate, graduate, graduate. Look for Christian. It is this worldliness in attitude that is destroying people and is destroying leaders. But you know, if you yield your life to the Lord and you say, Lord, just plan my life for me. God will plan your life. Uh, why are we here? Our God is a good God. And you know, even if we have failed until this very day we are talking, if you make up your mind this morning, you are going to succeed. Yeah. Then I've told you, number nine, laziness. Just write that one down. down. You've already had a lecture on laziness already. Refusal to put all your strength to the work of God. Refusal to put all your strength into it. Number ten, the love of money. The love of money. In First Timothy chapter six, verses six to ten. Have you found the people that now they have come to work, even ordinarily in the secular work, and as they have come to do the work within the first uh, month, they are looking for uh, either promotion or they are looking for raise in salary or they are looking for uh, some bonus. And the people that have employed them will say, ah, you just came in last month and you're asking for more money now. That person, they will mark him down. They'll be looking at him that this one, uh, they don't think that this one has come to really do work here. The same thing in the Christian fold. Love of money can get a person away from success in his life. But as I have uh, told you, the Lord, our God, is a God who can help us to succeed if we ourselves are willing to succeed. And if you'll take all these things out of your life, success will come in Jesus' name. Amen. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein, and, uh, therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, thou shalt have good success. God will make us to succeed. 
God will make his work to prosper in our hands. And even apart from his work, our marriage will succeed. The work we do to support ourselves, if we are not full-time workers, that work will also succeed. On the basis that this word of God you have heard will never depart from you. That you will meditate day and, day and night, so that in partnership with God, you'll make your life, you'll make your work, you'll make your ministration, you'll make everything that you do in life, only one life, this single life you have, everything will succeed in Jesus' name. Rise up and let us pray.